And please be seated. And kids, kids, come on up. <laughs> There's a bunch of them, let's tell you. Oh my goodness, there is a bunch of you here this morning. I am so happy to see all of you. Yes. Amazing, great. So very, very happy to see you. So I brought this morning, what is this? A ring, a very special kind of ring though. What kind of ring is this? A wedding ring, yeah. Yeah, so if I were to come over here to um, Hazel and put this ring on her finger, give me your finger, Hazel. Oh, no, you don't wanna be married, okay. All right, Mia, if I put this ring on Mia's finger, now she's married, right? No, no, she is not married. We get the married ring after we get married, right? It's just a symbol of that we belong to somebody else, that we love someone else. Just like Jamie this morning got baptized, and that was just a symbol of her love for Christ, okay? So that water, just like my ring, doesn't make me a married or anyone married just by putting on a ring and going into the water and being baptized doesn't make her a Christian. It doesn't make her a follower of Christ. She had to ask for that forgiveness first. God had to come into her heart and, and um, she had to go to him and say, I'm a sinner, okay? So just being baptized in that water doesn't do anything for us, okay? It's just a symbol. Does that make sense? Yes, I have a verse this morning. As soon as, this is from Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. So, and a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So even Jesus performed that symbol, and his father was well pleased. It's a sign of obedience and following Christ. Okay? All right. You guys are dismissed this morning. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And Lord, as the, the children make their exodus, we pray for them, Lord, and we are so thankful for them, for their enthusiasm, and Lord, for their, their witness. And we ask that as they go to Children's Church, Lord, that they will, they will see you, they will hear your word, and Lord, uh, they will be changed because of it. And we know that there are those who are so close to giving their lives to you. And Lord, we pray that you would complete that work in the name of Jesus. So thankful. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, I remember I, I said, I said a, number of, a number of months ago, I think it was sometime last year, maybe a couple years ago, that baptism without repentance is just a bath. Right? I mean, there's got, there's got to be a, a purpose behind it. If there's no repentance, then, then all of that is just to get wet. And so, but there is a, a tremendous, there's a deep purpose in, in getting in those baptism waters and, and showing others that there has been a change in my life. And this is the evidence, this is the proof that uh, I want you all to see. And it is, it is a, a powerful witness. We are still in the first chapter of Romans. And if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 1. And these verses we actually even um, alluded to last, last week, but they needed much more, more attention. And so this morning we're going to look at verses 19 and 20 of, of Romans 1. And I've, I've entitled today's message, The Evidence of God. And the, the music this morning, I love when the music and the message are a great marriage. 
And so, Matt, thank you for your sensitivity and praise team. I heard a bass solo this morning. I was back there uh, changing. I missed I miss the bass solo. So the evidence of God. And it, again, I love the faithfulness of God and his timing that I get to talk about this in light of his glory and majesty that will be on display tomorrow in the form of a of a total eclipse and we'll talk about that a little more as we go along so in your bibles romans chapter 1 verses 19 and 20 for what can be known about god is plain to them because god has shown it to them for his invisible attributes namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. And Heavenly Father, as we spend this time together in your word, I pray that you might reveal to me your your heart and you would speak through me your very words so so that our lives will be will be changed because of the word of God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Abraham Lincoln once said, I can see how it might be possible for a man to look down upon the earth and be an atheist, but I cannot conceive how he might look up into the heavens and say, there is no God. End quote. That is a great quote from President Lincoln. Mankind has, by nature, lived a godless life and has always existed in selfish societies, right? All, all down through the ages, you can see that societies have been uh, selfless and man-centered. And looking down upon the, that existence of man, would, one could make the assumption that there is no God. However, turn that point of view from looking down at man's existence to the gazing into the heavens, and you simply cannot deny the existence and the handiwork of God Almighty. Amen? And during the French Revolution, a French soldier said to an enemy prisoner, he said, we are going to pull down all that reminds you of God. And to which the prisoner replied, you'll have to pull the stars down then. As Psalm 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. These are scriptures that I've, that I've made mention of over the last few weeks and you can't deny them you can't just mention them once and then and then go forward without them and there will be more scriptures today and probably going forward that i have mentioned in this in this series and you just you can't you can't deny them and you can't leave them out because there is there is no one there is no one who has ever lived on the earth that is excused from seeing and knowing the existence of god because that's what scripture says because Paul says what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them I know this raises a lot of questions with a lot of people all people from all nations for all time have descended from one original family in Acts 17, Paul is, is addressing the men of, of Athens in the, the public arena. And in verses 26 and 27, he says, he says this, And he, God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us. And in Genesis chapter 10, after after the flood, all the generations of man are named. And they're all traced back to Noah. In Genesis 10, 32, 
It says, these are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies in their nations, and from these nations spread abroad all the earth after the flood. And scholars, scholars can trace back to the earliest origins of man an awareness of God and a, a need to atone for sin through sacrifice. And that all through the ages in various cultures, there has existed a, a, a common assumption for a, a creator and the revelation of a, of a creator. I, I think that is just instilled in man to understand that there is, there is a creator. But as you know, mankind has fallen prey to to man-made religions and fallen prey to the satanic deception that there are many gods, not one true God who created the heavens and the earth. Satan has, has twisted the truth. He has blinded man. He has convinced man that there is no evidence of an almighty creator. Even today, I tell you, just the, the stupidity of mankind is forever uh, magnified through social media. Amen? <laughs> so many people today, when asked about the existence of God, so many will say, I just don't see any evidence of a God or that the universe was created by a being. They've been, they're, they're blinded. They've been deceived. Because to us, it's, it's obvious, right? Right? It is obvious. <laughs> but that deceptive foolishness excuses no one. There's, there's no excuse from the biblical truth and the creative evidence of God's existence and his eternal glory. There's no excuse, not for anyone. Because it's on display, as scripture says, it's on display for all to see. I like that word all, because that's what it means. It means all. And that's all it means. All people from all times all cultures and regions of the world come from the same origin. All of us come from the same origin. It doesn't matter if you're from Woodlawn or from Uganda. So all people from all times, all cultures, all regions of the world are without excuse. Because what can be known about God is plain to them because he has shown it to them. And also, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When Moses was on the mountain to receive the, the Ten Commandments from God, and my, my only vision of that is Charlton Heston. And I, I, have to, I have to ask God to forgive me because that is my only perception of, of, of Moses. And I just don't think Moses was, was that... You know, but uh, but that was '50s cinematic drama for you. But still, what a great movie! When he was on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, uh, the the people they they complained, they were murmuring, they were complaining that he was delayed in coming down from the mountain. He was taking a long time. And what did the people do? Well, they they commanded Aaron to make for them gods of gold that these gods would go before them. And in Exodus 32, verses 7 through 10, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I have commanded them. 
They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. (laughs) Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. And they have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and saying, these are your gods, what we create with our hands. How quickly and how easily we are blinded and deceived from the truth and how quickly we are to follow evil and deny God. Yet the truth remains that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And because God has revealed his eternal power and his divine nature, and when Paul says he reveals his divine nature, that means his, the, the Godhead, it, it's Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the divine nature of God. He is revealed in the things that have been made. And all people everywhere are without excuse. And here's a bold statement. That yes, even those who have not heard the gospel message are without excuse because God has been revealed to them in his creation. We'll go a little deeper in that here in a little bit. And since God's wrath will be poured out against all ungodliness, all unrighteousness of men, we talked about that, was the scripture that we used last week, God's wrath will be poured out against all ungodliness, all unrighteousness of men. And since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, then all people everywhere in all cultures through all time are guilty and are responsible for sin. That's just plain and simple. That's not what we want to hear. That's not what we want to believe. And since the creation of the universe... His qualities have been on display for us to see and to behold. His eternal power and His divine nature. Again, the word all, all mankind for all history has been exposed to the witness of His creation. And many things, man has corrupted many things, right? Right? sinful nature has has corrupted many things but the witness of God's creation and the glory of God revealed in the heavens cannot be corrupted by man his glory is constantly on display uncorrupted by human hands or by the sinful nature of God his creation speaks of his glory and his divine nature day and night amen psalm 19 1 the heavens declare the glory of the god day by day they pour forth speech night by night they expose knowledge the stars in the sky the heavens speak of god day and night the witness of god the evidence of god is on display for all to see And if tomorrow's eclipse is a sign to us about the end times, is it? Some radicals would say yes. Genesis 1, 14 says this, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years 
so I can stand before you in my wealth of knowledge in the, in the arena of astronomy and, and astrophysics and end time or revelation I can say I do not know and if you do know if you say I know then I would ask you to remain quiet because you do not know <laughs> it might be uh, it might be of some amazing biblical cosmic significance and it might not be I did uh, I did check out NASA's website and according to NASA that's a pretty good resource right according to NASA there are four or five eclipses every year not here but around the globe throughout the year there are four or five and they are a spectacle they are something to to behold you know but they're not uncommon you know I mean there's not going to be another one here for how many years 30 some years or something after that it's like like 300 years I don't know so around here you know they're not going to be so so common for a while and you know the world the world certainly sits up and takes notice right I mean it's 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 big money got your glasses you know I've heard there's some fake ones going around too you know seriously if you bought them somewhere they're not <laughs> not proper you know you might end up being blinded by it so make sure you got the right kind of glasses to to look through but the world, the world takes notice of what's going on. Hebrews 1.3 says, He, Jesus, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus, the Son, the one who through the Holy Spirit spoke the universe into existence. He is the one who upholds and he causes with precision the planets and the cosmos to, to work in however they, it is that they work. He upholds it. He controls it. He ordains it. He sets them into place. So for the Christian who believes that God created the cosmos, for those of us who believe so and that and that it aligns in the way that he ordains, we are quick to say, behold the glory and the majesty of God Almighty. I hope those are the words that come out of your mouth. Because that should be. That should be our response. And as God expects us to learn who he is from his creation, he has he's made it so obvious that no one can miss it. His power and his divine nature, who he is, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, who he is, his, his divine nature are on display. Hopefully that we would see it and that we would be drawn to worship him right drawn to to lean in to him to recognize that he is that he is God the creator his glory we talked about God's glory last week the definition is the manifestation of his divine attributes the manifestation of his divine attributes, the glory of God. And it doesn't happen nearly uh, often enough, but I love it on, a, on a, a clear country night, away from the lights of town. I'm sure you've experienced this. The stars, they just explode in their brilliance in the night sky. And you can't see that in town. The light pollution 
you know, to the life that, that hinders from seeing the glory of God. It's so easy to look up and say, just say, wow, God, because the sky speaks of the majesty and the glory of God in his creation. So we have established that man is without excuse. When it comes to knowing about God. Because Romans 1.19, what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them without excuse. So here is the big however of the message. I almost said here's the big but, but that wouldn't really go over too well. But here is the big however, if I may, if I may put it that way. Nature reveals the majesty and the divine nature of God, right? However, his creation, and I want you to hear this, I want you to hear this, his creation cannot redeem anybody. Creation points man to God. Creation reveals the eternal power of God. Creation reveals God's omniscience and his omnipresence. Meaning that he's all-knowing. Meaning that he's everywhere at all times. But man is still fallen and sinful. And acknowledging God as creator will not save anyone. There are heathens that will acknowledge the presence of a, of a, of a creative being. It doesn't mean that they're redeemed. It doesn't mean that they're born again. But we still need a redeemer. And the one who says, I can worship God in nature, so I don't need the church, is just as misguided as the one who says there is no God. Pastor, what do you mean? But God's creation says there is a God who created all things. Nature points to the seasons, points to the stars and the planets in the, in the cosmos and how they interact within the, pre, the, the precision that God intends. But nature cannot satisfy man's need for redemption. Nature of itself knows nothing of forgiveness. Nature of itself teaches us no moral lessons. Nature speaks of the glory and the majesty of God, as Psalm 119 says. The heavens declare the glory of, of the Lord. But it cannot of itself offer a salvation for mankind's greatest need, which is forgiveness of sin. So we cannot say that God's creation is all that we need because his creation falls short. It's hard to say that, but God's creation falls short because it does not offer a solution for salvation. Biblical scholar and, and author John Phillips says, creation reveals the infinite power and glory of God, but it doesn't reveal his heart. Calvary alone unveils his heart. End quote. The cross where Jesus gave his life to pay for our sins reveals the heart for all mankind, the heart of God for all mankind. Without the cross, without the cross, we behold the majesty in God, the majesty of God in creation, but we miss the heart of God for people. And there have been people all through the ages that witnessed the glory of God in creation but still rejected the evidence of his existence. And despite the unmistakable witness of God's existence and his, his, his power and his divine nature, 
there are some people that have chosen not to believe. Just like today. But 2,000 years ago, the heart of God took center stage. The love of God for man expressed in the crucifixion of his only son. Revealed not only a God of power and of glory, but a heart of compassion for the sinner. And he put in place the only solution to rid the sinner of his sin. First John chapter 3, verse 16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. He sent his son to the cross. I deserve the punishment for my sin. You deserve the punishment for your sin. But God said no. That's mercy. He said, I will provide the way for you to be made right in my sight. And he says, that's not through my creation. It's only through the death, burial, and resurrection of my only son, Jesus. Romans 5, 8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's eternal power and his divine nature has been has been plainly evident in his creation, in his vast creation. And man, all mankind for all times and all cultures is without excuse in recognizing the existence of God. But the creation in, in all its glory and, and, and evidence of God creation falls short in revealing the heart of God that all people repent of sin calling on the name of Jesus in humility to receive the free gift of eternal life that comes only through Jesus Christ it's God's provision of salvation that is available to everyone and scripture even says it calls everyone everyone now I think it's also the book of Hebrews that said in days past in, in Old Testament days we relied on, on the prophets to tell us what God says but in these days he speaks God speaks through his, his son through the finished work of the cross his shed blood So I encourage you today to, yes, look at the heavens and see the glory of God, the majesty of God, the power of God on display. But that's not enough. I hope today, if you have not recognized your sin, that you will. And you will say, my God, I didn't realize that I had failed you. I hadn't realized that my sin has separated me from you. So, Lord, would you, would you save me? Would you forgive me and set my feet on the path of righteousness? Let's pray. Dear God, we do, we do proclaim your power and your divine nature, your glory, as witnessed in the heavens, in the stars, in the sky, and then the patterns, in the seasons. Lord, it is without question your handiwork and your glory. And Lord, my, my prayer is, Lord, that as millions and millions and millions of people witness this eclipse on uh, tomorrow, Lord, that they will not only see it as a wonder of the cosmos, but they will recognize that you are the one who created all things and that, Lord, you would reveal to them their need for 
a savior, their need to be forgiven of their sins. And that, Lord, you would make a way for them to receive your free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. And Lord, this morning I, I pray that as you, as you move in this place, that you will, you will nudge those who need to make a decision. You will, you will remind those that just need to hear from you. If there's someone that needs a healing touch today, Lord, that they will receive that from you. If there is someone who needs salvation today, Lord, that they will respond to your invitation to make things all right in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen.